Good to see you out this morning. Let's begin our service with hymn number 62. 62. Crown him with many crowns. Let's stand together. <laughs>
Father, we pray meet with us this morning. I'm excited because I don't care what the temperature is outside or how bad the snow is blowing. Father, I'm just so pleased to be counted as one of your children. Amen. Amen. Oh, Father, thank you for loving each and every one of us. Thank you so much. Meet with us this morning that we might rejoice together that the name above all names, our Lord above all lords, is Jesus Christ, in whose name we come. Amen. Another hymn, hymn number 40, Great is Thy Faithfulness, number 40. <clears throat>
wonder when Terry was sharing earlier about a friend they had met was having a, a double bypass and a valve replacement. It, it reminded me of a Dodge I had once. That was always break the down. Never had that trouble with a Ford. <laughs> anyway. Uh, an additional prayer request I'd like to share with you. I, uh, Louise shared it with me coming in. Uh, her house, you know, is on the market where she lives, and there are people coming today to look at it. Uh, so it was kind of throws Louise's life in a bit of an unsettledness, so please be in prayer for her and for uh, that whole process. We know Louise is pretty tough, and she can handle about anything God throws her way, but nevertheless, it's a bit of an upheaval of the yeah. Or even not know the change of land for But anyway. Um, also, yeah, I know I'm joking around, but uh, well, I'm so thrilled that Terry's here. I just, I, I know y'all, the rest of you are too, but it's such a cool thing. It is, it's a cool thing. You know? um, when I, an aside, very short aside, when I had my brain hemorrhage, from which most people die behind my head, and I lived, don't ask me why, God threw me back. And, uh, but it was a month later, a man in my church, about my age, a little older, had the very same thing, Irwin Marks. Remember him? Was, no, yeah. No, it was, it was Mr. Fenton. Fenton. Huh? Joe Fenton. Oh, Joe yeah, Fenton. Joe Fenton. No, that was something different. Okay. It was Mr. Marks was driving. He was in the passenger seat of his car coming home. His wife was driving and he slumped over and was dead. Right on the spot. So it's a it's a wonderful thing when God blesses family and individuals to allow us to stay here a little longer. Although we know where we're headed, it's uh, that's glorious in itself, Amen. But nevertheless, it's always hard to leave those you love. Anyway, we're in uh, First Peter still. We're kind of chugging along, and uh, I'm always excited about this passage. We used it once in the campus ministry as our verse for the year. That's uh, chapter 3, verse 15. Um, in the King James it says, But sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is, within, that is in you with meekness and fear. We memorized it through the NIV. It says about the same thing, just a couple of different words. But what does it mean to be ready um, and, and to give an answer? How do you get ready? Scripture gives uh, some, uh, some ideas, and it's really quite a lot different than what you hear in a lot of churches where they say, we're going to have an evangelism program. God doesn't have necessarily an evangelism program. He simply says, be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within you. Well, what does that mean? I can explore that just a little bit this morning as an encouragement to each other. For example, I've alluded to the fact that when I had a brain hemorrhage, I survived, but it was a very unique experience. I'm sure as you, it would be interesting to match notes you and I. Just, I think there would be a lot of similarities in our experience. But it was an opportunity in my survival to share with a lot of people how unusual the circumstance was and how, in the midst of that, God was present in my life. I was easily able to give a reason for the hope that lies within me, Jesus Christ, by sharing how God had taking our hands step by step through the process um, and, 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 and how he spoke in our lives through that experience. Did that happen to you? Where God spoke into your life? Did you feel like that? Yes, I'm sure. Anybody who's experienced that sort of uh, near-death experience, and in your case, it was death for a moment. In this particular wonderful verse, he says, be ready always to give an answer. Well, what does that mean? In our outline, a, ready, a reason to give, not, and I want to point this out here, this is not 
an appeal for what is, in our modern age, what is called an apologetic. An apologetic is not an apology, it's a strange word, but a defense of the truth of Scripture. The apologists, the Christian apologists of our 21st century are people who have studied and done research in multiple areas of science and expertise to prove the scriptures are true. There are people who are creationists who spend their whole life establishing that the account of creation in the first several chapters of Genesis are absolutely accurate and literal as they stand. They've made a career out of it. There are archaeologists and linguists and, and anthropologists and all sorts of all these ologists who have made a study. And then not to prove that, well, there really was a tribe of Amalekites. Even though they vanished from the face of the planet, there is, through archaeology, archaeological records, proof that because there's references to Amalekites. But they're not found in general in the archaeological record, but they were in Scripture. So you have all sorts of people um, coming to the defense of God, saying, you should believe God and the Bible because it's true and I can prove it to you. That's not what this verse is saying. There are many theologians who are far more brainy than I am. In fact, I'm a pea brain compared to most of them who have developed all sorts of theological, logical, and reasonable, rational explanations why belief in scriptures is the most rational thing a human being can do. Christian philosophers do the same thing. They can prove to you every which way from Tuesday that what's in this book is true and you ought to subscribe to it. Thus, you ought to believe in Jesus Christ and his message of salvation. That's not what this verse is saying, I don't believe. That's part of it. We have people who are, who are masters within denominations, uh, who are masters of doctrinal defense to keep doctrinal purity. And while I subscribe to that as a necessary element to the church and to the Bible, it isn't what this verse is talking about. I don't believe. I believe what this verse is talking about is this kind of thing. Do you remember when you fell in love with their spouse? Do you remember when you prepared yourself? Did you prepare yourself? <laughs> did you have to make a scientific study of love? to somehow intuitively know that you empirically fit the categories, the criteria for a man or a woman who's in love with a member of the opposite sex and who you want to spend the rest of your life with. You probably didn't apply any great science to it. You probably responded in some intuitive way that there were certain qualities of character there were certain uh, 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 strengths, even in light of weaknesses, that uh, overcame weaknesses. There were goal-oriented. The person was, it, it, uh, it, it had incentive in life. He was a hard worker, never took anything for granted. And maybe most of all, he was, for you ladies, a great kisser. You know, I don't have June smiling now. <laughs> anyway, that kind of defense. Why do I love this person? Well, you could go tick off a lot of things, but really, in the end, it's because you have this deep and abiding and growing and maturing relationship with this person. The longer you hang out with them, the more you discover they're exactly what it was thought they were, that intuitively you knew they were, that it's about a relationship. It's about, do you enjoy spending time with your, you can go with your spouse or your children? How do you explain that? Because there's a desire in there to hang out together. 
I have a desire. It's probably as strong as the desires I have in life. Every fall, my son comes for about a week to hunt deer with me. For me, that's the most special time of the year because I hardly ever get to see him at any other time. Why is that so special to me? Because I love to shoot deer? Well, yeah, but that's pretty far down the list. It's special for a whole bunch of reasons, but the primary reason is I love my son. And while he sometimes drives me nuts, I mean, really nuts, there's nothing better I like to do than spending time with him. Why? I don't know why, because I love him. Well, why do you love him? Because he's my son. Well, so what? I have a deep and abiding relationship with him. We have similar interests. We have similar goals. We have similar attitudes. We have similar everything. Uh, well, I can't say everything. Because the things that were dissimilar, he lets me know about. Very precisely. Very clear. <laughs> That's what this verse is talking about, I believe. It says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. He's, there is a place in Scripture. We're not addressing that place in Scripture that says, study to show yourself approved. When he talks about studying Scripture, studying doctrine, studying theology, studying the truths about Scripture. When Paul says to Timothy, study to show yourself approved, he says, don't be a slacker about knowing what's in this book. You should know. You should know it from cover to cover the best you can with the ability that God's given to you and the discipline of time to study it. That's clear. But this passage says, sanctify or reverence the Lord God in your hearts. What that means is, is that you love God, you love Christ, you have so many common interests, you have so many common goals, and that there isn't anyone else you'd rather spend time with hanging out with than Jesus. Now I love hanging out with bears. We got to be old people, and uh, well, I'm a, a lot older than she is. I mean, she's like 29. but. Um, we got to this place in the winter time where she'll always ask in the morning, you're going to be home by lunchtime. And I'm generally not, and uh, although sometimes I am. But I say, well, I usually be home by two, and then, uh, and then she'll be way out, bring the paper home. If she isn't going out, and we'll read the paper for a second, and then she'll say to me, you want to take a nap? <laughs> now, that's a luxury I've never had in my life, to take a nap with my dear wife in the afternoon. So we go upstairs, and my wife thinks that sleeping in a cold room is just delightful. So I'm dressed up in my coats and my sweatshirts, and I go run up and jump out of the covers, and it's so comfortable, it's so warm, and we enjoy it so much. We just fall right asleep, and it's the best time of day. I just love doing that. Now that may seem kind of slothful to a lot of people, but I love it. <coughs> and I think Babs does too, although from time to time I have snorted and woken her up. But uh, I love those times. Verse 15, reference the Lord in your hearts. I love God. I want to hang out with Him. I want to read His Word. Why? Well, I can give you all sorts of doctrinal reasons, and I can tell you that this is truth, and I can prove it through anthropologists and theologians and philosophers. But what I really want to do, and what he's talking about here, be ready to give an answer always to every man for the reason of the hope that is in you. That hope that's in you. Not a doctrine, not a theology, a hope. And the hope. That's the important part here. It's in your outline, and I'm skipping over a lot of your outline, is the hope's name has a name, and the name for hope is Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. It's about relationship. You Please hear me correctly. You do need to know, I'm not discounting it, you do need to know what Scripture says and teaches. There's no way around that. Scripture is emphatic about knowing the Word. 
Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Well, unless you know what yet the word of God is, it won't be a lamp to your feet, which means you have to know God's word. But what this verse says is that I have a relationship with Jesus Christ that's dearest to me than any other relationship I have. Now, how can I explain that? Give a reason. Now, in the context here, Peter is saying, I know what you're going to face. Because I've already faced it. People will say, oh, you're one of those Christians. You're one of those crazy people that believe in the Bible is true. You're one of those people that, that, uh, that uh, think everything is literal. You're in the scriptures. You think that, uh, that uh, God really cares about you. you. Nobody believes in the Bible anymore. That's old-fashioned stuff. That's mythology. And they're going to accuse you of all sorts of things. They're going to accuse you is that you must hate women if you don't allow them abortion rights. Because don't women have a right to their own bodies? And if you were really a Christian, you would say, yes, indeed, women are equal and they have their rights over their unborn. Can't do that. That's what we're coming to in our culture. But Peter says, I know all about it. I've been there. People have accused me of slander, deceit, lying. They've made up stories about me. They're going to come to me, and they're, as they have, and they're going to come to you, and they're going to be angry at you because you say Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Is it true? Amen? Yes, it is. Will you compromise that truth? Absolutely not. It is that much as God strengthens you, the most important thing you have to hold on to is not whether the rapture happens in the beginning of the tribulation or the end, but that Christ is Lord. When He comes, He comes. You better be ready in a twinkling of an eye. But it's because of the relationship. If you believe in free will or election, matters not nearly as much as the relationship you have with Jesus Christ. If you're not nurtured, you know you in a marriage, I don't know how this works for you, but God has graced my marriage for nearly 50 years. Go figure how any woman could have ever put up with me. For half that long is beyond my understanding. But somehow in God's grace, He gave me a woman that tolerated me and turned me to Christ. When I was all done with God and Christ and we left college, I was so mad at God and Christians, I didn't have anything else to do with them. And she said, when we moved to Genesee, let's go to this church or that church. And finally, she turned me to Christ and put me in an environment where the pastor said, you know, you really should wear something besides a ripped up tie-dye t-shirt and ripped up tie-dye pants and sandals to church on Sunday morning and maybe you shouldn't throw your feet over the pew in front of you. He never said a word. He loved me back to Christ. You know why? Because his relationship with Christ was more important than all the rules and regulations that he had grown up in. And he nurtured me just as my wife did the same by saying, Hey, Dave, he comes down. I knew it was coming down. One day he was coming, coming down. He had it. I rubbed him the wrong way, but far enough, and I pushed him over the edge, and, and, and he put his arm around me at the end of church one Sunday, and he said, Dave, I said, oh boy, here it comes. I'm so ready. I've been waiting so long to tell him off. He's going to lay some Christian thing on me that is just going to... Make me explode. He said, hey, Dave, instead of saying, you got to knock this garbage off, he said, Dave, we need a first baseman on the church baseball team. Would you come and play with us? Completely disarmed me. I was ready to just blast him. Instead, he said he wanted me to be a part of this church uh, in Geneseo and a part of the baseball team with a bunch of guys. Well, he knew it was going to be anything but trouble. And he still loved me. So when I say in this verse that it's not necessarily about doctrine, although that's wrapped up in it, everything's woven together, it is about relationship. That man, that pastor, what a relationship with me. My wife wanted an enduring relationship with me rather than just throw it in the towel or throwing a tire iron at me in the middle of the night or something like that, knocking my skull in, which 
would have been justifiable homicide, probably. Um, she stuck with it. I have a reason for that hope that's within me. I have a hope that I'll make it to 50 year anniversary of my marriage. And I hope it'll be a good marriage that my children can look at and others can look at and be able to say, how in the world did that ever work? Only the grace of God. Because it was built on a relationship one to another, a relationship with Jesus Christ. That was, even though we weren't, when we were younger, not very serious about God, we knew it was important, God was important. But he took the back seat with me for a lot of years. The hope that lies within me is about Jesus. Now, if you want to talk about Jesus, I can talk about Jesus for a long time. The reason for that hope that lies within me, the reason that Jesus Christ is in me, I can talk about that a long time. And it gives me great joy to do that. And you do the same thing. Terry, in days ahead, will begin to put some of these things together. It takes a little while to process everything that's happened. It really does. And I know you're way far smarter than I am, but it'll still take you a while to figure this out. Because it's like, well, why God? And the question isn't always why, it's why not? Or what did you want to teach me? What are you showing me? How did you want me to grow? How have I grown? Because he loves us and wants to be involved in our life. And sometimes he grabs us by the shirt and shakes us real hard. Sometimes makes our hearts stop or our brains blow up or something else like that to that. And says, okay, you got my attention, God. Help me to see what you're trying to teach me. But it's about a relationship. Because we can learn all the verses in this book from cover to cover, but if we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean anything, does it? Peter is saying, very simply, people will come to you and say, can you explain this hope that you have within you? And what they're really saying, because they don't know that hope unless you explain that that hope is your relationship with Jesus. How can it get any better than that? You don't have to know scripture from cover to cover to tell people about Jesus, do you? What's he done in your life? I, I, I look around here and I see what Christ has done in so many of your lives. It just astonishes me. I mean, it shouldn't be astonishing because that's the business God is in. But I look around and I see, I see Lisa and I think, hallelujah, Jesus, help me because we have a relationship that we have a relationship with Christ to never neglect praying for her because she has challenges in her life that I don't have. I have challenges too, not quite the same. But I need to remember her. I need to know that anybody that ever rides in the car with Eric needs to be prayed for. <laughs> Russ knows exactly what I'm saying. So, although that, nah, he said, that's cool. I don't know. They're blood brothers. What can you say? They're both speed freaks. But uh, I finally got feeling back in my hand from having a ride. From, he did this. <laughs> I thought I, I thought we were going to get this grand accident. I'm digressing. and I know. And he did it on purpose. I know he did. And Russell said, what was a big deal? He had everything... He fishtailed, did a fishtail on a wheelie down here at the light, right in front of the antique shop. Maybe you saw it, Nick. The light was kind of half green and half not green. And he decided he was going to turn left as we were going for lunch for Brian's. And, and sure enough, he started out across the intersection. There was a car come speeding the other way from the east. And they weren't turning. They were going straight. For a moment, he hesitated. Like, should I stop or should I go? In Eric's mind, there's only one direction to go, and that's forward as fast as you can go. The problem is, I'm in the passenger seat, and this other car is coming, lickety split right toward me, and then I feel the back end of the car spin around, almost drive into the tractor trailer truck, into the other lane, and I'm, I'm speechless. I lost my appetite. <laughs> Now, I can talk about it. I mean, it's funny, right? But you know, guys, you know, Wally, I love this guy. And uh, I got this appreciation for Russ that <laughs> he's cut out of the same cloth. But, 
but we have this relationship. I would never have known Eric or Terry or Tim or any of you if it wasn't for my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the glue that sticks us together. That's the hope I have within you. That's the hope you have within you. And that's what he says, share that hope. Always be ready to share the hope of Jesus Christ in you. You don't need to have a PhD in philosophy to do that. Just share what your relationship with Jesus looks like. And don't do it with, he says, these two words, meekness and fear. He says, do it meekly. Don't, don't get in somebody's face and say, you need to believe in Jesus Christ, and if you don't, you're going right to hell. That may be true, but it won't win them over, probably. Just do it with gentleness and respect. Which is sometimes hard to do with people who hate Christ. My joy this morning is that I've realized once again that while it's important, I've said it three times now, and I want you to make sure you hear this, that doctrine, knowing scripture, is vital. But the core of it is your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a relational experience, people. We know that. We just sometimes forget it at any rate. God bless us as we continue to grow. And I would say, just in, as we close, I close, that we're going to meet at the church for prayer this Tuesday night. And I know it's difficult for many of you to get out. But this week, we're going to pray for a man who's coming here this weekend. We're going to pray for us. We're going to pray for this church. We're going to pray for the man God is calling here. And that if this is the man, there remains to be seen. We need to pray for him and pray for discernment on his part and ours as well. And so I'd like to call us together. If you can have all make it, please come and we'll pray together. Would you pray together with me as we call our time? Father, thank you so much. I rejoice. Father, I have a hope. His name is Jesus, and He has given me salvation and redemption through the sacrifice of His life and the shedding of His blood, that I have hope, eternal, that it is not temporary. It isn't dependent on my circumstances, my health, my job, my other relationships, my relationship with you is forever and ever. My relationship with each of the folks in this congregation who call upon your name as Lord is eternal as well. It may make some of us groan to think that you have a relationship with me forever and ever. It might make you feel uncomfortable, Lisa that we will share eternity together through the bonds of Jesus Christ and Tim and, and Eric and June and on and on, Father, we thank you that the hope that lives within us is Jesus. That's all there is. That the sum total, it is the bullseye of everything that we are about. When I, when I spoke about Alice yesterday morning to the men's group and I said here's a woman who loves Jesus and she asks everyone who comes into her room do you know Jesus now I don't know Alice probably knows scripture better than I do but she knows the thing that's important to know is Jesus and she makes a point of inquiring of everyone so, Father, I pray that you would help us to reach out to people. Be ready to share the love of Christ with others, what he means to us. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for this time this morning. We pray your blessing, particularly on Louise today, as her home is a little bit in uh, trouble and a little turmoil. We pray for Eric and Russ that he might get his uh, good connection plane trip back to Texas. Pray for Eric as he travels back to Detroit on Wednesday. And Father, just pray that you would continue to guard him. We thank you again for Terry. I thank you that he's here this morning. And I pray he'll be here for a long, long time. We give you glory and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
praise book. The front part of the book, praise one, number 29. My hope is in the Lord. Stand together and sing together.